Welcome everyone. Before starting our seminar, I will please ask you to put your phones on silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruptions. This session is being recorded and this presentation will be in English. Finally, our staff, uh, you, you can see the QR code you have on your tag. So at the end of the seminar, you can complete the electronic evaluation for this session before you leave the room. You can also um, let us know if you have any problems so we can help you. And now we are ready to start. This current session is under the track access. The title of the presentation is Enhancing Learning Outcomes, Explain Hybrid Learning Strategies and Tools by Claudia Vega and Roberto Rivera from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us in our session. It's a small group, so when we ask questions, I'm just going to, I guess, pick one of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we can all participate. Uh, my name is Roberto Rivera. I'm an instructional designer with the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. The University of Texas is the very south of the state. Uh, again, it's predominantly Hispanic institution. It's about 98% Hispanic that we have in our in, in, in the university. And joining me is Claudia. Just uh, hello, everyone. My name is Claudia Vela. I'm an instructional designer. Um, Robert is in Brownsville. And I mean, everywhere, it's the same uni university, we have two different campuses. I also have experience teaching um, for, for some, for a few years, but I've taught mainly face to face, um, taking hands. I've been teaching a lot uh, using technology, online learning, and hybrid. So today it's all about hybrid. So please feel welcome to ask any questions or. Um, just comment on what we're presenting today. So, funny thing about Harvard, usually, if, if, if when we present this, we could talk about students. But after the pandemic, our office went into a hybrid modality where we work uh, remote one week, and then we see we go we work face to face. Actually, go to the university. So that has worked great because I work. I used to work full time on uh, remote, and that can get like. You know, change for a day or two. You're like, oh, I'm just working. Now you don't see anybody, and that's all you do. So it kind of makes that connection, and it's not so much where you have to go to the office all the time. You know, you kind of get a, a break. You wake up a little bit later. You know, you can maybe schedule to see, uh, spend a week with your sister or any family members. So that works fine. So hi the hybrid allows one of the I think one of the big benefits is that it gives you that flexibility, right? Just like just like we want that flexibility, even now because it's. Uh, it gives us the ability to make other things plan different ways. That also allows students to like plan ahead, right? They have different commitments. They got families, they got jobs. So uh, after the pandemic, uh, it was noticeable that students needed to, wanted this, they realized that what they were learning in school, what they were doing in school, could didn't have to be done in class, right? It could be done also sometimes remotely. Uh, but they also want that's, that interaction with each other. So. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the topics that I've heard today is like student engagement, right? Students want, how do we engage your students? And I know I was teaching this, this this semester, and one of the things is like, it's hard to engage your students, right? A face-to-face -face class, right? Uh, for whatever reason, right? But hopefully, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get down to it, what, what tools we use. So, we would like to ask you, uh, when you hear the word uh, hybrid learning, like, what comes to mind when you when you hear that? Um, education where you combine um, presential tools and online tools in, in a proportional way. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else in the shirt? Non traditional. Non traditional. That's yeah. Okay. Anybody else? We'll come back to the other ones later. Uh, so yeah, so I think I mentioned already uh, why we should what we should care about hybrid learning. Uh, it is almost non-traditional. Yeah, and we'll go into a slide later on on how our university allows students to choose when they're registering to choose that option. Right, because some students initially want an online class, but they're full. So now, okay, what's the next step? Well, there's it's a hyper learning, right? Or maybe some students are not ready to jump into an online learning environment yet. So they're thinking, well, I'm going to do it in the face to face, maybe I'll try my hand in the hybrid course, right? Because I still, I can, I, can, I can see the professor maybe once a week or every other week, 
I can interact with my students, I can ask for help right there, you know. After classroom, you say it, you understand this. I remember back in college, walking out, we're like, did you get anything? Well, I didn't understand. Like, I was like, oh, me neither. Like, you want to get together, maybe study, make a study group? So those kind of, so that, that's, that, kind of, that gets kind of lost in a fully online course, right? Because usually, Zoom meeting, uh, maybe videos turned off. As soon as they're done, right, they're, they're gone. But in face-to-face, -face, in a hybrid, you get, you get that chance to like make a connection, maybe gather after class, impromptu studying, right? Uh, so again, it enables students to continue learning, right? That's what we want, we want students to keep enrolling in, in the courses because we want to sustain enrollment, right? That's one of the things that students want. They want flexibility, and there was an every cost survey, I think it was back in 2019, that they were predicting that hybrid learning was gonna be one of the, one of the things students would want, right? Because sometimes they don't wanna go fully online, right? but sometimes they don't want to come to class either, right? So they want, students want more flexibility. They want the option to say, today I don't want to go to class. And that was the, I think back in 2020, that was the high flex models that are very popular, right? Where, but that was very difficult to implement because you give students complete choice of how you want it and it was like, it's, it's a lot of chaos, a lot of technology, a lot of grouping, trying to keep track of who's who, right? So I think hybrid, um, hybrid learning approach uh, was kind of like the sweet spot. So, so to speak, right? So today we'll kind of we will define what hybrid is, right? Uh, what it is and what it isn't, and we'll do this on how we do it in, that, in our university because there's some there's a definition that we have to stick to uh, because we're we're a Texas institution, right? Uh, we'll look at how to promote student engagement, and we'll at the end uh, in the time we we'll look at some tools. I know Cosna cover quizzes, which is a great tool. I know she's she's used that as, as one of the strategies to engage her students in the classroom, right? <laughs> right. So in a nutshell, um, what is hybrid? Like you were mentioning, it, con it contains a, a, a mixture of both. So the idea is that you get, hopefully, the best of each um, area, right? The best of the, of the traditional phase and the best of the fully online, right? So what's the best part of the fully online is that the materials are already created uh, for the students they can access. If there's a lecture, they can replay it, right? They can re-watch, re redo it. And also, uh, the best component, I think, in the face-to-face -face is that you have that face time with the instructor. You can, if, if they go over something, you can ask the question, like, I don't get it. Or even the instructor can look at each other's faces and say, oh, it looks like they're not understanding what I'm saying, so let me repeat this, right? Or, and the idea is that there is requires planning. Right, so the best of those worlds will require the professor to plan for it and to use that class time to for interact with the student. That be group work, uh, make sure the if there's something a topic that wasn't addressed that's confusing. Uh, how do you know that? Because you're looking at the online component. Have students access any of the courses? Um, what's the what's the what's the grading look like in there? Um, and you have Q and A. Maybe they can ask questions before they come to class. And then you can prepare. Okay, this class time. We're going to focus on what what the students need, what they want, what they have the questions on, right? So that class time is spent clarifying student needs, right? We make sure uh, they're all not falling behind. If there's some that are moving ahead, then you can maybe give them extra things to do, right? And it's also referred um, to be called blends, blended learning, mixed learning, right? And also reducing. So that's how we started naming it in our, into our into our institution, so they would know. And it's kind of reducing it, like it's not less, it's less, it's not less uh, seats in the classroom, but it's like less classroom time that you need to be there. So I don't know if you can see this very well. Uh, to one end is the face, it's a completely face-to-face -face class, right? The traditional one, where, like here, everybody's expected to be the same place at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. and, on, and on the other end, far end, is the online component where uh, the instructor and the student are really never at the same in the same place at the same time, right? Uh, so the, the sweet spot, but uh, we would think is, will be the hybrid, right? Where again, you're getting the best of those worlds, right? The best strategies and including them uh, into a hybrid component. So the difference here would be that a blended course, it's not really a hybrid, but just you know, I have a, I have a, I'm teaching on face to face, but you know what? I'm, I want to, I'm gonna give my test online because I want to use maybe a, a lockdown browser to make sure 
there's no there's no funny business going on, and that way I keep track who's taking the test, who uh, who's taking so long, which questions. So you, you might want to augment your classroom with online components. That doesn't really make it an online class or a hybrid class because no instruction is taking place online, not yet. So that's so once instruction starts taking place online and on face to face, that's when it starts uh, moving into a hybrid course, a hybrid. Uh, model approach. So, like I mentioned earlier, uh, in our institution, how we define a, a hybrid course is a course in which the majority, that's more than 50%, but less, less than 85% of the planned instruction occurs when the student and the instructor are not in the same place. All right, 50 to 85, because sometimes if you teach in a face-to-face -face class and you, and you start doing everything online, and you tell students don't have to come, that becomes an online, that's really an online class and it has to be labeled as such, right? Again, for, for the fees and all of because the way it has to be labeled on, 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 on the course catalog. Because if you're making it an online course, uh, in our institution there's some trainings that we have to give our faculty before they can teach, right? It's not as simple as just uploading a PowerPoint, a file, and tell students, email the students, hey, do this this week, and that's it. Um, and also because if it's, if you don't at least give them more than 50, then that makes sure that means you're just making your students come to class all the time. And remember, students want that flexibility, right? So this this is a page from from, from my course schedule uh, that students can able can filter the courses that are available. Uh, one of the choices is traditional, which is a face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, one is a fully online. And this is the, the new option that they have that we've, that we've included after the pandemic uh, uh, to, uh, to include hybrid reduced seating courses. Because when we first started after the pandemic, we're doing high flex, but we're doing Zoom rooms. Remember Zoom rooms? <laughs> but, yeah, they, they didn't work for us because we were requiring someone to be at, at, the, at the office in the institution in case students wanted to go in there and because maybe they didn't have an uh, internet connection. So someone had to be there, either the instructor or someone else, a, a technician. Uh, and so it was really, it was really difficult to, to implement, to keep those Zoom rooms going, right? In case some, sometimes no one would show up to the Zoom room because they like, give students a choice. You, have, you want to come to class or you want to stay home? Uh, they are going to stay, stay home. I mean, too, probably. You know, like, uh, <laughs> unless I have questions. So if I have questions, like, and it's only an online class, you kind of feel embarrassed, like, I don't know. Do we meet? I know there's online classes. Uh, so that's why I think a hybrid allows students, even the, the shy ones that don't want to ask questions, like maybe in an online format because maybe you're recording something, or you're recording the presentation, like even to, to just after class talk to the instructor real quietly, can I talk to you? And then, yeah, sure. Right? So I think that's, that's one of the advantage. Uh, so Hyflex approach, it was very popular. I know we, we studied it and we, that was proposed to do right away. But that we that was abandoned okay. shortly after because it was they required a lot of bandwidth, a lot of resources that we couldn't just keep using. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so what we did after that is now we have a, a syllabus template that we give out to our faculty. That it's developed every year, and one of the first things we tell them is to make sure you select the modality of the course. So students know right away, okay, this is the right course, right? So we start offering, before we just go online, but now we have, we separate it where it's online asynchronous, which, uh, which means you don't have to be in the same classroom, right? So all the instruction happens completely online, uh, not, but not at the same time. But uh, again, because we want student engagement, uh, we want faculty presence, right? So that's something that students keep, keep, keep saying in their evaluations. Uh, we do have online synchronous courses, which those have required time meeting times. Uh, so, but instead of going to the university, they meet uh, usually through Zoom or Black or Collaborate. The meeting time stays; it's uh, in the schedule, but it's up to the faculty member to decide what tool they want to use. They can use Teams now, because so now we adopt the Teams as well. And yeah, so we had traditional face-to-face -face, uh, and interactive video courses, which was another one. That was another component, but we have one instructor, like Claudia works at our McAllen office, Edinburgh, I work in the Bronzeville, so sometimes 
let's say I was the instructor, that was a TV here uh, linked to another room over there with other students, but no instructor over there. So that was that's that's what that's what an, an, an interactive video course, and also that was also part of the strategy of the Zoom, right? So imagine student coming in and the door's locked or something's not working. Yeah, it just it could be a frustrating experience for all of us involved. Did you have any experience with that? <laughs> Well, some experience with ITV, it's very difficult because with ITV you have two different groups, right? For example, we have two campuses, one in Brownsville, uh, where Robert's office is located, and one in Edinburgh, which are two cities, like 40 minutes apart, right? So, and a professor has to be with one group um, in class on Tuesday and have the rest of the students on Zoom, for example. And then on the next class, it's the other way. The professor goes to the other campus and has those students in, in present, you know, present, and then the other students on Zoom. So it brings a lot of challenges for the professor, especially if they don't have a teaching assistant helping them with the group that is on Zoom. And after the pandemic, this is what we tried to do with hybrid because we needed students to be, um, we needed to have social distance, right? So, but it didn't work either because it was very difficult for faculty to do. Fortunately, it was just one semester that we tried to do it and every, and then um, after the, the first semester, everything went kind of to normal, right? So, but hybrid looks different in every campus. In every campus, if you um, if you know faculty teaching hybrid, you're gonna see a different thing. So, because it depends on the on the department, it depends on your program needs, right? So, we're gonna tell you how we see it in our university, and maybe you can share with us uh, what's your experience. Yeah, so when, whenever we have, we also have to offer a hybrid academy to our faculty that we, that we know that they'll be teaching hybrid for the first time. So they go through the, to that academy. We have a, on, one ongoing right now for the, for the, spring, for the spring semester. And one, one, of the, one of the first things we tell faculty, like you never know when another uh, event like pandemic is going to happen. Like it could be hurricanes, like weather related. So we, 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 we start by saying you can develop a fully online course first. And then once you see, okay, you know what, I'm gonna this week I'm just gonna do this on, on, on the classroom side. Right? So you that way you always prepare. If something happens that week, you can't be first person, you're sick, uh, you have conference, anything happens, you, you know what, I already have this developed for an online part two. So that's kind of like uh, sort of like a high a high flex in reverse because you wanna do it online first, have everything ready in case you can meet uh, on campus and face to face. All right, so based on our definition, uh, this is one of the questions we have for faculty, because our faculty also like, well, this is hybrid, like, no, it's not hybrid, you just uploaded a lot of PowerPoints, it's not, it's not a hybrid course, uh, it's not even an online course. Uh, we, we, so we yeah, start asking, like, if you, if you are using Blackboard to assign and collect student work electronically, and to upload recorded class sessions for students that, make, that miss classes. Uh, so we would, we would ask, we ask them, that, is that a hybrid course? Because sometimes they would say, well, I'm not gonna go to class, I'm just gonna record myself and give it to the students and miss it. I was like, I was like that's not how it works. That's pretty much uh, emergency remote teaching, right? And then after that, we go back to normal. Like, you can't be doing that every week and call it a hybrid course because, uh, I mean, a face to face or online is not, it's not a hybrid course at all. That would be like an augmented course or even a blended course, right? Where it's a face to face class and you just say, well, this week we can't meet because of the weather. But I'm gonna record the session for you to view, that way we don't fall behind, right? Because again, we, we want to meet those learning learning outcomes by the end of the semester. Uh, this one, they had a little, there was a little more challenging for instructors when we asked them that um, the students meet regularly in person throughout the semester, but there are a, a significant number of scheduled sessions where students meet online or work asynchronously instead. And I think what threw them off was the word significant, uh, right? The word significant amount. Because a definition says 50 to 85%, right? 
but there's no there's no higher police in our in our university. No one's looking at your course. Hey, this is way more. You know, it's pretty much on the honor system. You, if you're going to teach a hybrid course, uh, we expect that to be like 50 to 85 percent. I mean, some of them might have 45, some might go a little higher to 90 percent. Uh, but still, we don't say, hey, you can't be doing this, right? But again, it, when it's really noticeable, is when we start seeing a face-to-face -face class that has all the online components in there. So we're like, well, maybe you need to like reclassify this course because. Uh, now instead of being a face-to-face, -face, it's now hybrid or an online based on what you're using, right? And maybe students will want to enroll in this, right? So the benefits uh, that, we've, that we've seen and read about it, it's usually, I mean, it's based on what the student needs, right? The flexibility, right? So they're able to come to class. Uh, uh, again, I mentioned they have a lot of commitments. And if they know that they don't have to come to, the, to campus, Two or three times a week, or maybe every other week, they can plan ahead their semester, right? If they have, if they have medical appointments, uh, family appointments that they, they need to take care of, they can plan ahead, right? Uh, again, there's the effective use of class time. So now instead of maybe just uh, lecturing, now you use a class time to solve problems. Or uh, if they have questions, then you can use that time uh, to put them in group work, right? That's, 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 it's something that's going to engage the students. So, and some of the tools, like maybe use quizzes to just to uh, see if they learn the material, see if they read what they were supposed to do. Right? And again, there's more opportunities to students to participate. And, I, and, and there's more opportunities because some students are shy students that don't want to raise their hand in the classroom. They just quiet in the back, listen, and then they go and they don't ask questions. But in an online environment, if you include a discussion forum where there, there's a Q&A, those students are more likely to type a question because you know there's no one looking at them, raise their hand, or judging. Those sort of things they're judging how they speak or how they look. Uh, it's uh, I guess the students finding a safer place for them to just ask a question and not feel like, well, I know this question is done, but I'm gonna it's here. You know, hopefully. And then you'll see that a lot of students have the same question, and it helps the student professor because sometimes you get emails with the same question every time. But if one of you have a discussion uh, forum, one student asks the question, and the rest can say, oh, OK, thank you for asking that. You should do what we'll see in the replies. And there's also improved outcomes, right? Because students get the, get the chance to review the material on their own time. But there's a hybrid approach. But there's all the challenges, right? We, I, mean, I think that the main one was the technical issues, because again, now, now you're teaching two modalities. Right? Now, you, now you're including technology into, into your teaching practice. That means you have to be proficient with the LMS, how it works, whether it's Blackboard, Canvas. You have to be able to set up an online test, right? create the test, add assignments, create the content, set up the content, make it sure it's visible to the students. Because sometimes you see that as an instructor, but if, for some reason, students can't see it. So you got to double check that. Uh, before, maybe in the face-to-face -face class, you, you didn't have to worry that much. But now, when you're going hybrid, you do have to worry about that. And you, have, you kind of have to learn that before the students do, because students will ask you those questions first to you, right? I can't ask you this, so if this video is not playing, I get this error, right? Uh, and again, uh, the challenge, I mean, there was, was a benefit too, but it's also a challenge because what happens when you're on those weeks that you're hybrid, you're remote? There's distractions because maybe the phone rings, someone knocks at the door. You, you think you want to do more than one, more than two things at once. You, maybe you're washing the dishes, you, you listen to the lecture, you have things in the laundry. So those can be distracting because you think you, you think you think you can do it all because you're you're on you in your house, but it's actually very distracting. All right. But sometimes when I have to work remote, <laughs> I'm like you know what, this, there's too much going on today here at the house. There's construction. There's, they're fixing something. I'm just gonna go to the office, and but where I know, like I'm not gonna be asked like what's the dishes. They are, like do the laundry. You know, but that's just maybe just me. And my girlfriend's gonna do the things like that. Uh, but again, it can be. There's distractions there, right? Uh, we mentioned faculty and student, student readiness. You know? So students, just because they're on their phone all day, they can send messages, text. That doesn't mean they're ready to for an online class, right? So an online class requires a lot of commitment. Right, uh, a lot of self direction. Right, uh, so in the hybrid, what it what it does is that 
instead so of them making the jump from fully from face to face to online, they can make the jump, I guess, a little step to hybrid, where, okay, they're a little more self directed. And once they, when hopefully they see they can succeed, they can take the next step to take fully online courses. Because we're heading to uh, our university where we're starting to offer a lot of a lot of degrees online, a lot of master's degrees, and now doctorate degrees could be online as well. So we want those students to stay there and enroll into our master program. So we don't want them to go somewhere else because it's a lot of competition that's going on, right? And yeah, we mentioned uh, managing dual learning environments. Now you have to manage students online, manage students in your face to face classroom. And the other thing is like like I mentioned earlier, a hybrid looks different just about every university you go to, right? You can have someone, oh, they'll do a hybrid. This is, what, this is what university calls hybrid. But you have to decide on an approach. How are you, what are you going to use to uh, reach the same learning outcomes, but now in, in a hybrid uh, approach? Oh. And can anybody else think of any other benefits or disadvantages of hybrid learning that maybe at the this is just open questions to see if, any, if anything you've seen with students or yourself taking a, a hybrid course and you say, well, this was, I like this, of, the, of this model, or this is what I found challenging implementing with my students. Well, I, I teach a course that I do, but because I'm working with computers, so what I do, in, because I teach hybrid courses, we have six classes that are online, and the other six, the students are by themselves working on the content um, of the online platform. What I do is I try to do concrete exercises using the computer in the classroom and giving them step-by-step -step instruction of I, I, let's say they have an assignment, so I give them an example of one of the questions of the, exam, of the assignment and then they go home and finish the, the exercise. So what I do is I, I have a tutorial document so they can keep doing the work at home, but during the activity in the classroom they will talk to the other students and they get to be partners in study and then after that they keep contacting them. I, I think it's a very social a activity. Yeah, I, I, I took, I'm a master's computer science, I'm actually computer science. That was one of the things uh, that I like. Once the class is over, like everybody's like, let's work at the summer. I mean, why not? Let's just go to the lab and work it together, see what we get. So we will go and try to figure out, are you getting in? I don't know, okay. So we'll, the struggle, part of being together in the struggle is kind of like building communities. Like I'm not getting in and like, oh, this is working out. Oh, what you do? Okay, so let's work together. So I think that's, I mean, uh, that's one of the things I remember the most about when I'm on undergrad, like having to go to the labs and spend like days in there trying to get the program to work, to, to make, it be, uh, make it better. So if it was a fully online class, I mean, to maybe, they will lose some of that, right? Because they're, especially if you, anything like technology related, you could probably do it, do it from your home and not have to see anybody. Uh, but you, we're, we're, we're social animals, right? We need that interaction, talking to someone. And that helps, like, where students get that, have at least that opportunity to have impromptu, like, get together. Yeah, great example. Thank you, Robert. Well, um, you know, I've been, I've been in education for over 30 years. So I started teaching and I taught for 16 years and then I was out of the classroom for about 11 years and then I came back last year. And I thought it was extremely challenging and I don't know what you, you're thinking about these new generations. Um, I grew up in the 70s, so I started teaching in the 90s and it's a totally different thing because on one side we think that these kids are technology savvy and they love technology so we can go to the point of using too much technology in the classroom and then realizing that it's not what they want, right? Um, so I, last semester I taught freshmen and for me it was very difficult, it was challenging 
because I didn't think they were prepared for a hybrid approach. And the flipped model, it's a hybrid approach, right? Hybrid, actually, it takes all the strategies from the flipped model. So what we wanted to present to you today, um, it's also resources, so we're gonna send you this presentation. So this link will take you to more information on what flipped, uh, the, a flipped classroom is. So if you're new to flip, to the flip model or to the hybrid model, or if you would like to um, redesign your course, if you're teaching a traditional course and you, you want to redesign it to hybrid, uh, please feel welcome to um, check all these resources. My experience is, as an instructional designer, that most faculty um, don't prepare to teach uh, hybrid. So even for teaching hybrid, it's like teaching online. We need professional development. We need to go to workshops because there are different uh, things that we require in every modality, right? Most of us started teaching face-to-face. -face. We know how to do it. But I think especially with hybrid because it's in between. Uh, sometimes I see faculty um, teaching like they're teaching just face to face and using Blackboard. It's the platform that we use in our institution. Just as a, as a place where they have the readings and they have the students um, uh, submitting assignments. I've seen instructors that ask the students to send them um, assignments by email and they're teaching hybrid. So, um, so what you were saying about faculty readiness and student readiness, it's very important when we consider what modality we're going to teach, right? So sometimes we have no choice, and it's going to be a hybrid classroom with freshmen, and um, that, well, that's what we get. Okay, so what happens in the traditional classroom? If we see this pyramid, what do we do in a traditional class? Teaching. Yeah, most of the time we lecture, we give the students, we share with the students the concepts. So what we do in the traditional classroom is that we go with them over the um, lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy, right? And then they, they go home and they do the homework and, it's, uh, and they cover the, the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. What happens in the flipped classroom is flipped. They, they do it differently. Now, what is the difference between blended, flipped, and hybrid? Because hybrid and blended are used interchangeably, right? But flipped, it's where you have students, um, where you have students doing the reading and getting the knowledge at home, right? and then come into the classroom and have more active learning activities. That is the flipped, um, that is the flipped model. That, that it was challenging to me last semester with my freshman students because they still don't have the, they don't know, they didn't know Blackboard to start with, so it was very difficult for them to, they're not self-regulated yet for college, right? So they don't know how to study, in college, they don't know how to study by themselves without having the professor telling them what to do. So it was a little bit challenging. Okay, so in the flipped classroom, uh, we're gonna have the, the remember understanding all these lower level, um, lower lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy done in the classroom. I'm sorry, outside of the classroom, and then in the classroom, we're gonna do the opposite, right? So this is what we expect the students to do, to have discussions, to have conversations. What happens when the university is investing, because that's what our previous presenter was, was telling us about, and you're using technology, you have all the right elements in your class, but the students are not responding. What, what do you do to encourage the students to participate in the classroom? Yes, what I, I well, we were doing the pandemia. I needed to teach classes every week or every other week for four hours. Uh, 
asynchronic, so we needed to be talking and things like that. So I decided to make surveys. I took the content and I posted surveys about topics, so they needed to answer. And sometimes they, they were seven or eight, and then I have only three answering. So that's why and I kept saying, well, I need three more and things like that. So they get up from the couch and come to answer the questions. So the, the surveys are good. Uh, also, I, I give them visas for five minutes so they went to the fridge and things like that. And also, I, I post a debate question and then they begin to talk about what their ideas and compare, things like that. So it was difficult because you have, always I, I did like three and a half hours or three hours, but you know, keep all this time that people attending the class it was very difficult. So I designed with very small groups to obtain their, their interest. And we find, in my case, they didn't turn on the, the, the video. So I, I, everybody was there on the dark, and I am here by myself. So, and it was difficult because we don't have a policy here that, that the students need to be with the camera on. Mm -hmm. So we need to encourage the, the university management to make a policy standard so if we are doing a conference to Blackboard, we use um, the same platform because you are by yourself in the house and all this is dark. <laughs> so you feel yes, it's, it's a feeling for you that is uh, not uh, like you're to comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's what happened to me last semester. Our attendance policy, it's very open. So I ended up having like 10 students out of 26 in the classroom and then students expect to still submit assignments and pass the class right so so that's why i also want to talk to you about what to have on the syllabus the syllabus is very important even though students might not read it as well as we want them to read it it's very important to have all this information on the syllabus so uh, what do we need to increase the student engagement? And this is what I was asking you about having all these elements because I'm sure you've been teaching for many years. And this is something that you've already implemented, right? To engage your students. What do you think is working for you right now? Is it technology or is it having um, conversations with them in the classroom, discussions, online discussions? For me, it's um, encouraging self-assessment. So one of the one of the things that I do uh, now, I, I'm not teaching hybrid, but one of the things that I do in general is um, have them think about their own process of, of learning. So I, at the beginning of the semester, I have them create their own learning goal, for example. And so then, throughout the semester, they, they're sort of gaining ownership of what they're learning. In a lot of cases, they've never been asked to do that, and so they struggle with it, right? Well, what do I, you know, in, in essence, they're answering, what do I want to get out of this, right? Once this is done, what should I be able to do? Um, and so, uh, but it does increase engagement in that they now have some stake in the game, right? It's not just me saying, here's what you have to learn. It's me saying, you're going to learn these things, but what do you want to learn? And then let's talk about that, mm -hmm. right? And so I think for me, that's the, the self-assessment. Is, is what's helping us a lot. Ah, there's five minutes. Yeah. Ah, five okay. minutes. Okay, especially with Kyrak, it's very important to make expectations clear, to have them on the syllabus. Kyrak can be asynchronous, but it can also be synchronous. Um, if it's asynchronous, you might have micro lectures, right, just to reinforce concepts. You're going to have discussions, you're going to have projects where students are going to work together. Uh, remember that in hybrid, it's not, hybrid is not completely face-to-face, -face. it shouldn't be completely online. So both elements are equally important. 
Right, so on the syllabus, this is some, an example of what you can have on the syllabus. If your institution doesn't have anything like this yet, it would be very important that you can implement it. So we're going to send you this. This is just an example, and then you can modify it accordingly to, to your needs. Okay, so this is an example of a class schedule that I, we also recommend um, that you have on your platform. This is something that we usually have on Blackboard so students know what are going to be the, the topics that are going to be covered in the class and what, are gonna be, what is going to be covered online. That the expectations have to be clear. Okay, so this is also for you. This is a resource that will uh, tell you how to use um, different activities in different modalities. For example, how can you use discussions uh, in the classroom, but how can you also use discussions online? Right, so this, is a, this link will take you to this resource. And um, so you can get more ideas about, about strategies or, or ways that students can interact. Something important about hybrid is that students need to interact online. If, if you don't have that interaction online, it's not a hybrid, all right? So if you only use the platform for students to submit assignments, that would be more blended or tech enhanced, but it's not gonna be hybrid learning. So always if you're teaching face to face and you want to flip the class, uh, you can start by flipping 20 minutes of your class. Okay, 20 minutes that you're going to put online. That's, that's the recommendation to start. Okay, so now that we're using technology, what, is, what are the technologies that support hybrid learning? I was going to show you how to use quizzes, but probably you've seen it. Quizzes for me saved, saved the day last semester. Because I had a class where students wouldn't talk at all. I would come in. They wouldn't say hi, they wouldn't say goodbye, sometimes they would just, they would just look at me. So n nothing that I did sometimes worked. So what I started doing was, for example, use uh, quizzes, and because the students always have their computer with them or they have their phones, at least they were able to participate, like if they were using Mentimeter or Kahoot, they can use the same with quizzes. Now, what I like about quizzes is not about the advantages that it has for students, but the advantages that it has for instructors. Because it saves you time. For example, if you use quizzes and you have a PDF, you have an article, for example, it can convert it, quizzes can convert it into a whole presentation. And it's an, an interactive presentation because it's going to be like a PowerPoint but it's gonna have questions like the ones you have in Kahoot. So it has this, it gamifies the presentation. So I really recommend you to check it out. And you're also going to have all these links. Um, these are all technologies that support hybrid learning. I only recommend to use two or three te technologies in the semester. Too much technology for students, it's a little overwhelming too, right? Okay, so this is the link. Um, this is how you can access quizzes. I don't think we have time right to, to do that. The only thing you need for quizzes is your Google account. Um, and that's it. Let me see if I can at least show it to you. So you need your, your um, Google account. It's free until a certain point. Let me see if we got about two minutes. Maybe I can show you mine. I think that if she's doing you can ask your question while she Yes, um, good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation and I, I I am going now to present in another room, so I, I am too. I, I need to run, but 
Do you select by, by uh, what do you use to define a hybrid a hybrid course at your institution? This definition uh, using the fifty percent and the eighty five percentage. Do you have some base to do that, or your accreditation institutions use that definition to to uh, measure what you do in these courses? Yeah, that's that's what we do because that's our accreditation. Institution that does. Yes, that's, um, the, the higher, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. That's their definition. Mm -hmm. And that is yeah. their definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. Okay. So in, in that case, I can understand that at least fifteen percentage of the course should be presential. Fifth, at least fifty. At least fifty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank yes. you. So who who determines the the schedule is that the mm -hmm. faculty member, and they, do they do that ahead of time, or, or how far ahead of time do they determine like uh, synchronous uh, meetings? So uh, it's, uh, it's usually, I mean, it's a combination of faculty and usually the dean of the department. Because even our semesters start next week, and they're still juggling classes right now. Okay. I mean, it depends on also the enrollment too. Yeah. So some, sometimes a face to face doesn't make so, the, but the, the hybrid does. So then they they might open up another another Harvard uh, because the other one didn't have enrollment, or so they make that into an online class. Okay. So that's still based. Everything's still at the last. Initially, they they have all the sections to give students choices. If they see the enrollments, then that's when they start dropping. Yeah. Even it's going ongoing like today. And the and one there. more question. You mentioned that to teach online, faculty have to complete training. What about to teach hybrid? Do they have to complete any kind of required training? Well, we, we treat our hybrid, uh, so we have the, the, uh, the online, um, by the first step they have to do is we're, we're, we're a QM, uh, QM institution, they have to have, so they have to be in the MR, and we're, we're trying to get them to enroll into a hybrid academy, which is we take them and develop their course uh, for, for the upcoming semester. It's, it's not required for all the um, I know that, for example, new faculty, they are not required because they are lecturers. So they are not required to take any of the trainings. So and that is especially important, especially for hybrid, right? Um, because I, I think that most of them, that were students already using technology, they haven't been a hybrid student. They have, they have all, always been an online or face-to-face -face student. So even then, they don't have the experience as a student, right? Okay, so I just want, you to, I want to show you very quickly, this is a presentation on quizzes, and this was um, generated from a PDF. So you can have a PDF and then upload it to quizzes, and it generates an interactive presentation. So it's even better than Kahoot, because it, you're not only going to have the presentation, but you're also going to have the interactive questions. So at least you're going to have students participating in the class on those days that they just don't, they're tired or they don't want to talk too much, right? Because you, have, you can have different kind, kinds of questions. So I also used to have reflections, reflection questions. So, and, and that was really good for me because even if they were not reflecting orally, I was able to, to read their reflections, right? It's not ideal that it's how we can we have to adjust our classes when we're teaching. And you also those YouTube videos you mentioned. Yes, um, for example, you can have a YouTube video, you upload it to quizzes and it generates a quiz. So that's really, really, really nice, right? Just uh, because sometimes we ask the students to watch quizzes, but they're not, we're not making them accountable for, uh, for that because it's more a formative kind of um, activity. So if we want to make them really watch the quiz and pay attention, you can have, I mean, watch the video, you can have a quiz. Yeah, and it generates the quizzes like in seconds. You don't have to spend a lot of time um, using that technology. So our time's up, but thank you so much for the presentation, and thank you also for the questions. Don't, uh, don't forget to uh, go to the forum. So welcome everyone to the seminar.
as you already know, please, before starting, uh, change your mobile phones to silent mode so we can have your full attention and our interruptions. This session is being recorded. This presentation will be in English. And finally, don't forget to complete the electronic evaluation for this session. You can find the QR code on your tag. And now we're ready to start. Uh, this current session is under the track of student track. The title of the presentation is A Study of Alumni Copper Batteries and is our speaker, Kevin Patina from the University of Houston, Delta. Hello, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, one of my research uh, projects, uh, the study of aluminum copper batteries. But I'm also going to be presenting a bunch of other uh, batteries of different uh, forms. Uh, all of them under the umbrella of renewable and uh, portable batteries based on recyclable and household materials. Uh, since our project is based on green energy and recyclable materials, uh, we focused on these 12 principles of uh, green chemistry, which is to prevent waste. We didn't, we didn't want to create more waste with our products or with our uh, inventions because we're uh, trying to uh, alleviate some of those issues. And uh, we wanted to also, at the same time, create, uh, mitigate pollution. So we want uh, safe chemical designs within our, within our um, uh, research. We, wanted, uh, we, didn't, we don't want a hazardous synthesis. So when these different materials interact with the environment, we don't want them to uh, mix or react with each other that could cause harmful events, even if the materials that we used weren't harmful themselves. Uh, we want to use renewable uh, food feedstocks which basically means that we want materials that are easily accessible, uh, that don't need uh, such grand amounts of production, because even with uh, pretty safe or renewable materials, sometimes they have uh, the production of them can be very complex and could end up creating pollution through uh, the factory uh, process. Uh, we want to use catalysts, not uh, stoichiometric uh, reagents. Uh, basically, we want uh, nothing that's too artificially um, generated so we want natural materials we want something that, that we can find in the environment without having to uh, produce them in a lab because we want to use household materials recyclable materials things that have already been created things that already, already can be found uh, we want to avoid uh, chemical derivatives this is um, uh, following up again we want something that's natural something that we can find something that's not too complex we don't have to go out of our way to produce more chemicals produce more things such as that and we want to maximize the atom economy basically uh, mitigate the amount of uh, waste uh, uh, at the atomic level, which sounds really complex, but it's just uh, we want to be efficient. We don't want to use um, an extraneous amount of materials for something that does, doesn't need it. Uh, we want to use safer solvents and reaction conditions. We want to make the uh, production of these materials, of these uh, different batteries, to be safe and to um, not require super hyper specific conditions because then if we have a like laboratory environment where we need these hyper specific conditions for this one battery to work that's just very inefficient and not very very much worth the effort <coughs> we want to increase energy efficiency so we want to create these batteries and the batteries that we created are not the greatest because we want to use uh, very common materials we didn't go out of our way to like um, a specific manufacturer to find them we had to uh, use what we had on hand within our homes or within our laboratory, within our uh, city. Uh, so we wanted to uh, use these materials and create a, a battery that functions and then develop on them so that they can become more and more efficient. Uh, we want to design chemicals uh, to degrade after use. So what this means is that we want chemicals to be used, we want materials to be used, and to not remain in the environment. Because there's a lot of things like plastics and stuff that can remain in the water and in the ground for uh, thousands and thousands of years that end up doing a lot of harm. There's a lot of harm with microplastics especially, but within the ocean uh, going on. So we want to prevent that. Uh, analyze in real time to prevent pollution. We want to constantly be vigilant about what kind of materials we're using, what kind of uh, production methods we have so that we don't produce any pollution, because the whole point is that we're trying to use green energy to uh, mitigate the pollution. And uh, minimize the potential for actions. We want to make sure that this um, is efficient, it's safe, it doesn't cause pollution, but we also want to make sure that the production of it actually doesn't have that much risk for, for uh, danger. 
because there's like some chemicals that he can produce that can end up in explosions or can end up with a poisonous and toxic gas and we want to make sure that we don't uh, pose that risk because what would be the point of creating such an efficient uh, green energy type of battery if the production of it could lead to a massive explosion or massive disaster that could pollute the environment even worse. So the outline for our general project is to use recycled materials, household materials, um, anything that we could pretty much find and packages it, package it into a small portable battery solution that's alternative to standard uh, lithium batteries and such that are much more uh, costly to produce, especially because the materials are very rare. Um, so we have a uh, handful of different batteries that we're going to go over, uh, but they're all focused on green energy, so uh, no waste, recyclable materials. Um, uh, very efficient uh, for, for the quality of materials that we have and uh, that can be applied in the field. So we have a bunch of different field applications and such for, for these batteries. And the first one we're going to go over is uh, microbial fuel cell uh, based batteries, uh, MFC is what I'm going to call them for short. Uh, it's, in essence, they're batteries that comprise of two parts. One part, which is a, a cathode chamber, which is aerobic, which means it just uh, contains oxygen and a second chamber, which can be an anaerobic, which means it will not contain oxygen. And in that uh, anaerobic chamber, which is our cathode, we're going to have uh, anaerobic uh, bacteria. And these bacteria uh, will, uh, within their uh, metabolic processes, when they uh, consume food and create waste and such, they create a, a, a cycle of uh, a redox reaction, which is, the way, which is typically how batteries work. So we've been able to uh, produce this um, this battery, which uses the um, re redox reaction of the bacteria's uh, metabolic processes to create a simulation of like what a battery would do, uh, uh, taking electrons from a, a uh, anode chamber into the cathode chamber. Uh, and we have a, um, a couple graphs here. Uh, we had three batteries, three battery cells, which were put together in two different formations, a series and a parallel. Uh, we tested both of these uh, alongside different uh, sugars or the, the food that we used for the, um, the bacteria. We had uh, fructose, salt water, we had uh, distilled water, and we had a control, um, which is just like standard water that we, that we had uh, from the environment. And we put them together and we measured the different uh, outputs that they were able to produce. This is what those looked like. They were just, um, there was three sets, each of them connected by a, a tube, and we put a lot of tape on them to make sure nothing gets in or out. And um, we had all of these put together in this big stand to separate them from anything outside, make sure nothing can interact with them, and uh, set them up so that we could uh, unplug and plug in those wires and create these, uh, the, the series and the parallel uh, simultaneously without having to, to rebuild or create multiple of these because we have very limited materials. Uh, our second battery here is a uh, earth and soil cell based battery. These are very interesting because they sort of function like solar panels in a way, but they're just dirt. Dirt that we found in the environment and we put uh, as like a prototype within a um, ice cube sheet. Uh, as you can see, which is very interesting, the, the, the soil after left out in the sun for a while is producing some amount of electricity. And we use uh, this as, a, as more of a, a frame of reference as an example uh, for uh, more solar batteries, uh, which we use very old um, CDs because they are constructed to function with like light to be able to, to, to read light within a CD player. So we, we figured that they'll be able to, to absorb light in a way that that's, doesn't require a massive, expensive um, solar panel. And they were actually functioned pretty well. They, did, they were able to produce uh, electricity after being out in the sun. Uh, the next thing we have here is natural dye and its application in pH value, semi-quantitative and titration measurement. Uh, Sounds complicated, but it's basically we used a very specific type of chemical to be able to uh, uh, measure the electric processes that happen in batteries, the redox reaction. Um, and we did that by using the specific chemical found in different types of vegetables. One of the main ones is red cabbage. So we were able to boil the, the red cabbage and extract it through a, a titration process. 
and be able to get the specific chemical. An anthocyanin, uh, an anthocyanin molecule, which we've been able to uh, place within the, these different battery cells in order to measure how these electric processes uh, work to see if these batteries actually function. Uh, you can see here we have a homemade barrette, homemade uh, different like filtration uh, system. So instead of using a professionally made uh, titration or barrette, we did it homemade to, to prove that it's not a very complicated process. We don't need that much uh, materials to actually produce it. Uh, these are the different outcomes that we were able to come up with, the different pH values of those separate outcomes, the A, B, and C outcomes, and the reactions that we were able to uh, measure here with these dyes allowed us to um, prove that these batteries were able to function and produce some sort of amount of electricity. Uh, this is a, a visual of these um, different batteries functioning. You see the bubbles as they, the electricity is being produced. The, now we want to go in depth on a specific case study. This case study is the one that I personally worked on. It is the aluminum-based batteries. Um, so these batteries function very similarly to pretty much all batteries. It's based on a redox reaction, but I wanted to specifically create a redox reaction between two different metals like, like, um, that are very common. So we have copper and aluminum. These two are extremely common. We use them in wires, with aluminum foil, they're everywhere. So we wanted to figure, oh, uh, there's a ton of stuff like aluminum foil and stuff that people use and then discard and then well, they, they, we don't know what happens to them. They probably get recycled, but they're not, um, they're, they sometimes go into waste. So they're, they're not always recycled. So we figured we could probably use some of that uh, material to make a semi-functional battery. Um, we have a small uh, test here that we did before we constructed a, a physical battery to um, measure how this, this type of um, battery would functionally work. So we have a bunch of different um, uh, solutions of salt and water, just some basic sodium chloride, and the aluminum and the copper uh, anodes and cathodes uh, placed into separate baths and connected with wires, and we were able to produce uh, some light. That's a, uh, a LED light right there, it's orange. So in essence, we wanted to take that larger battery system and compress it down into a single like, bo like box, essentially, uh, by leaving some space for air to pass through and allowing the, the different electro electrons to pass between these different uh, anodes and cathodes and across the entirety of the battery with multiple cells, not just a single uh, stick of aluminum and copper. And we wanted to uh, um, outweigh the pros and cons of this type of battery. And although we realize that this battery will not be the strongest battery in the world, we do know that this will be extremely lightweight, extremely portable, and extremely helpful uh, in terms of uh, getting rid of some uh, pollution and waste from the environment. Uh, the aluminum uh, copper batteries uh, function off of the redox reaction, like I said, and uh, the batteries have a, uh, we, as we measured, would have a high energy density of 8.1 kilowatt uh, per kilogram. So the goal, again, would be to create uh, the cheapest battery possible with recyclable materials, very lightweight, very efficient, and uh, here we have some of the materials they use. This is now the process of when we were making the functional battery. We used um, cardboard stock and we placed a aluminum sheet above on top of them and we used electri uh, electricity tape so that no electricity would escape from it so it would all be contained to the battery. And we would just have these two different sheets, the anode and the cathode, a, um, just a flat aluminum sheet and the uh, cathode was a lot more specific. We, wanted, we didn't want to use too much copper because we know that there's going to be fun a lot more uh, functional aluminum uh, as waste rather than copper. So we used a very thin sheet of uh, copper mesh, which uh, is has a lot less copper than just like a, a copper foil or something, just to accurately represent how much copper we're gonna have. But in order to make sure that all of the electricity passed through, we created a, a paste to put on top of that cathode uh, strip, which was made of just some uh, acrylic paint and graphite powder, and we, were, we wanted the electricity to pass through the graphite and into the, the copper strip and continue through the, the cycle of the, the battery and the different cells. 
uh, again, our solution that we use, our electrolyte for the, the battery was just salt water, just uh, sodium chloride. And in the end, we created two batteries. Uh, battery A, which is the one on the left, which is a larger battery. It's about 13.5 by 9.5 centimeters. It is a 10-cell battery, and uh, both, these cells are, both these batteries are 10-cell batteries, so they're comprised of 10 components of an, of an anode-cathode pair. The smaller battery is approximately 9 by 7 centimeters, so it's, pro so it's about half as wide, but it is uh, equally as long. Uh, we wanted to test these batteries with LEDs because we figured that such a small battery that didn't really have a lot of power behind it would be able to, to function as like a, a light source because LED lights don't use a lot of electricity. So we use it as a very simple replacement for a lot of like light stuff and like small devices. So uh, within our tests, we were able to get a uh, battery A, which is a larger battery, to dimly light uh, the yellow LED, which was something that we noticed uh, despite every other LED functioning perfectly fine. And battery B was able to also light up every single uh, LED light of every single color, but battery B was able to light them up brighter. What can we show you here? These, two, these are the, the different pictures that we took for the, the two tests. Uh, as you can see, battery B ends up having brighter lights even between the same colors. Uh, especially with red, which we can see the very bottom left uh, image on battery A is the red light and the, the top left image on battery B is the red light. They're, that's the biggest example that I can give for how different these batteries were and how bright they were able to produce these lights. Uh, next we measured the different uh, voltage and, amp and uh, amplitude for these different batteries and what we noticed is that both of them started at 5 volts. And over the course of 24 hours, this will start to degrade over time, uh, ending up with a battery A having 3.96 and battery B having 2.94 volts. Uh, in the current, the amplitude, uh, we have a very big difference between both battery A and B. Battery B started up at a very high 7.2, but ended up degrading very quickly over the 24 hours to a 4.2. The battery um, A started at a very low 0 0.33 and degraded very little um, until it reached, after 24 hours, 0 0.23. Uh, what we concluded about these two batteries, uh, especially based on the, the physical test of the LEDs and the, the numerical measurements that we found, is that both, well, both battery A and B had uh, 5 um, volts. Um, battery uh, B degraded very quickly in both uh, respects, both voltage and in uh, and current. So we believe that the smaller size of battery B allows it to produce more current and functionally uh, apply more electricity to the, the things that it's connected to. That's why the lights were brighter than uh, any than the any of the ones from battery A. But because there's so much, they're uh, pushing out more electricity than battery A. They degrade a lot faster. Uh, here's some references for some of the research that I did for this project and a um, acknowledgement of a lot of the people that helped me on this assignment, especially um, Scholars Academy, uh, University of Houston Downtown, and my uh, faculty mentor, Dr. Jane. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your Um, <clears throat> my name is Catherine Escanante. I'm here with Eastern Connecticut State University. And I just think the concept of green chemistry is really, really interesting, um, especially in relation to like sustainability and like you were mentioned, like ocean and microplastics. I just wanted um, to kind of hear about your motivation and kind of going into, you know, kind of such a niche like green chemistry and conducting this study in the first place. Right. So I think that, um Global warming is probably one of the biggest crises that we're facing as like the entirety of the human race. Of course, there's a lot of problems in the world, I know that, but I feel like the most imminent danger that we face is uh, global warming. And I feel that we need to put our, our best foot forward to mitigate some of those uh, effects that climate change could bring by becoming a lot more green as like a, uh, with a lot of our products and such. And I know that 
some of those things won't happen unless we can create products to replace the previous ones that are a lot more efficient or a lot more helpful in very niche or specific environments to at least sort of cushion the blow of, of how fast we're leading down that path. Thank you. Any other question? So I want I wanted to ask was what was your biggest challenge during this process and how you overcome it? Um, the biggest problem was that we didn't have any any materials because we the whole pro the whole point of the process was to go out and find the materials, mm -hmm. not just purchase them. So that was uh, that was a little bit uh, troubling, especially since we uh, with a lot of materials that we did have, we had to simulate how it would be like it for to get the recycled materials. Mm -hmm. um, so like for example, copper, uh, for my battery specifically, uh, I could not find any copper related thing that would help me in my situation. So uh, I had to uh, resort to actually getting some copper from someone else and they only had copper meshes and I had to take that into consideration when creating my battery and uh, the environment for the, um, the recycled materials. Thank you. So if there's no any other question, uh, uh, remember that you can go here in your car and go to first day and fill out the form and also since the, this is like the last seminar of today you can go to general evaluation and fill out the form too. So thank you everyone for your questions and being present in this session and thank you for the presentation.